really happy today to introduce Dr. Lawrence Lowenthal. He's going to be doing a five part series on American writers for us. He did a little preview back, was it December, I think, um, when you did Langston Hughes, and that was so interesting. We thought we had to schedule him for the rest of the series. Um, thank you, as always, to the Friends of the Council on Aging for supporting our programs. And just to let you know, we are recording this program, so if anyone misses it um, or wants to see see it again, um, uh, we'll, we'll be uh, uh, sharing that. So take it away, Larry. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for inviting me back for the series on Great American Writers. Uh, today, I would like to focus on one of my favorite writers of all time, Thomas Wolfe, who wrote the classic novel, which I hope many of you uh, read, perhaps in your younger days, Look Homeward, Angel, originally published in 1929. Uh, got great reviews, was a immediate sensation almost overnight. Uh, a second massive autobiographical novel of Time and the River was published five years later. And that was followed after Thomas Wolfe's death at the very tragic early age of 37 by two more huge autobiographical novels published after his death, uh, The Web in the Rock and You Can't Go Home Again. These four novels constitute a total number of 3,000 pages. Thomas Wolfe died very young, but left behind a prodigious amount of literary output, uh, a lot of which even today has not seen the light of day. Um, Wolfe wrote with a passionate intensity. Those people who love him, as I do, respond to his rhapsodic style. And rhapsodic, I think, is the appropriate word to use uh, he left behind vast quantities of manuscripts. His basic theme focuses on the lonely uh, individual, the isolated artist uh, in search of self-identity, of meaning, of companionship in a very hostile world. And it is easy to see why so many young people through decades of American literary history responded so strongly, particularly to Look Homeward Angel. At his most ambitious, Thomas Wolfe wanted to produce and present to the world his vision of the essential magnificence of America, a, a country that he loved, a country that was as huge as his own physical uh, physique. He was six feet, six inches, tall. He weighed probably 275 pounds. Uh, he was immense. Uh, and his appetites were immense. His capacity to absorb life was beyond what normal human beings could possibly understand. Another central theme, and I'm trying to distill in the very limited time we have today, a huge writer uh, who's not easy to get your arms around, but I'm going to do my best. Another major theme is the search for a spiritual father, not only uh, important in Wolf's own life, but coming from his key literary mentor and influence, James Joyce. Those of you who have managed to struggle through Ulysses, Joyce's great novel, uh, know that this was a central theme. Uh, in all of Wolf's works, if you really want to get to the heart of what he's trying to do, uh, let me suggest that it has a lot to do with time, his perception of time. And this, I think, is what appeals uh, to people, uh, particularly at our senior level. There are three dimensions of time that haunt all our lives. Uh, first of all, there is time present. What is happening right now? What are you doing today? Uh, what are the events that are unfolding in your life uh, as you live it on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Um, it's the reality that shapes present time. And then, of course, the second dimension of time is time past. And the longer we live, 
the more voluminous, the more widespread, the more in-depth our past becomes, right? And the past is all that accumulated experience that gives shape and weight and meaning to the present. We all experience this. I know that at my age now, I can lie on my bed for half an hour, for an hour, just musing about events in my life, which I couldn't do when I was 20 and 22. The third dimension of time is what Wolf and perhaps anybody would call time eternal. Aside from time present and time past, there is time eternal, the time that we associate with the ocean, with a mountain, with the sky, with stars, with the moon, with rivers, um, with fields, a time that transcends any individual human experience. And what Wolf is trying to do in the thousands of pages that he produced is to control as best he could the three dimensions of time in terms of the life of one young protagonist whom he calls Eugene Gant. Uh, and this, I think, provides the global appeal of his writing. And the result is intensely personal search for meaning. It's often an attempt to reconcile so many opposites and contrasts in our lives. It's an attempt to provide his readers with the urge to find something significant and meaning in your life. At the time of his greatest success from 1929 uh, through decades, I'm not sure when Wolf's reputation began to decline, but he was considered one of the greatest of American writers, certainly in the same grouping of his contemporaries, Ernest Hemingway, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and William Faulkner. In fact, William Faulkner stated once that, in his opinion, Wolf may be the greatest talent of our generation because he aimed higher than any other writer. Faulkner went on to say, my admiration for Wolf is that he was willing to throw away style, coherence, uh, all the rules of precision to try to put the experience of the human heart on the head of a pin. Uh, Sinclair Lewis, the first American to win the Nobel Prize, 1930, said of Thomas Wolfe at that time, he may have a chance to become the greatest American writer. In fact, I do not see why he should not be the, uh, the one of the world's greatest writers, one of the world's greatest writers. And Malcolm Cowley, one of the leading literary critics of that time, actually said the following of Thomas Wolfe, the only contemporary writer who can be mentioned in the same breath as Dickens and Dostoevsky. But today, Wolfe's legacy has uh, faded, his reputation has diminished. Um, his books may still be in print, you can get them from Amazon, but I don't think you're going to really see them displayed in bookstores. Uh, his works are not really taught, as far as I know, in a, uh, college English classes. His works are no longer included in anthologies of great American writers. And as a matter of fact, if you're talking about Thomas Wolfe today, you have to make an immediate and clear distinction between Thomas Wolfe, the author of Look Homeward Angel, and Tom Wolfe. Uh, the more contemporary writer, The Gentleman in the White Suit, the author of bestsellers like Bonfire of the Vanities and uh, uh, The Right Stuff, who just died recently at the age of 88. My sense is, I haven't done enough research on this, but most young people today probably identify Tom Wolfe far more readily than they would identify Thomas Wolfe of La Comrade Angel. Uh, his influence, however, I think, uh, has to be clearly acknowledged um, on more contemporary writers. Uh, Jack Kerouac uh, and other members of the Beat Generation literally idolized Thomas Wolfe. Pat Conroy, uh, best-selling writer of the great Santini and uh, <clears throat> the Prince of Tides, said he began writing as soon as he finished the last sentence of Look, Homer, Angel 
Ray Bradbury idolized Thomas Wolfe and actually included Thomas Wolfe as a character in one of his books. And Ed Hammer Jr., who created the very successful TV series, The Waltons, uh, idolized Wolfe in his youth. Hunter Thompson, uh, the journalist credited Wolfe for his famous uh, statement about fear and loathing, which he found on page 62 of The Web and the Rock. Philip Roth just recently died, one of our greatest contemporary writers, clearly acknowledged his literary debt to Thomas Wolfe. Uh, Chris and I were just discussing before we came into the session, uh, the film Genius that appeared in 2016, just about four or four and a half years ago. Uh, I saw it, Chris saw it, but I'm not sure too many other people saw it. Uh, it was about Thomas Wolfe. Wolfe was played by Jude Law, uh, a highly competent actor. Uh, Colin Firth played Max Perkins, the absolute indispensable editor who literally saved Wolfe's works from oblivion by ruthless and highly skilled editing. And Thomas Wolfe's main love interest in his short life, Eileen Bernstein, was played by Nicole Kidman. Um, the role of Ernest Hemingway was played by Dominic West, uh, the British actor that many of you have seen in recent TV series. And F. Scott Fitzgerald was played by Guy Pearce, uh, an Australian actor. And I think the failure at the box office of the film is reflective of uh, the decline in Thomas Wolfe's reputation. 1957. Uh, a playwright that you may have utterly forgotten named Ketty Frings dramatized uh, Good uh, Look Home at Angel for the Broadway stage. And she won the Pulitzer Prize. I remember seeing the play at the Ethel Barrymore Theater with my mother. I was 19 years old. The play was brilliant. It was beautifully directed and written and performed. It starred Anthony Perkins playing Eugene Gant, the prototype of Thomas Wolfe, Joe Van Fleet, remember her, uh, playing his mother, Hugh Griffith playing his father. Uh, one of the key events in Thomas Wolfe's life was the tragic death of his older and beloved brother, Ben. And the end of act one is the death of Ben and Eugene Gant's tragic and heartbreaking outcry of grief. Um, the curtain came down, the lights went up and I was literally bathed in tears. I was embarrassed. It's one of those moments I'll never forget. About 15, 16, 17 years ago, my wife and I drove down south. I wanted to see uh, some key cities that I had never been in before, but we stopped in Asheville, North Carolina, <clears throat> where Thomas Wolfe was born and raised. Uh, we stayed about two nights. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Thomas Wolfe's home, his birthplace, which had been made into a national a historic archive, had been burned to the ground by an arsonist who was never caught. Uh, they had saved some relics and artifacts which they had displayed in a small little museum. I remember seeing that. Um, in 2011, the house was finally fully restored by a two and a half million dollar grant. But again, interestingly, it draws no more than about 6,000 people a year. So. One of the key questions that interests me is why does a writer's reputation wax and wane, um, like Thomas Wolfe? Uh, even his harshest critics will, would not question his genius, but many would question whether he directed it well. Uh, and it's, I'll try to explain by quoting Wolfe himself. Uh, Wolfe wrote, words that literally poured out of his mind and heart and soul the way lava pours out of an erupting volcano. He was a possessed writer in the highest romantic sense of the word. Um, again, he was a huge man, 6'6", six, six, uh, 275 pounds. His fingers and hands were so large he couldn't comfortably use a typewriter. Believe it or not, the millions of words that poured out of him were written while standing and using the top of a refrigerator as a desk and holding a pencil. Didn't even use a pen. He wrote all his millions of words with a pencil. 
and he wrote it in ledgers, which filled crates, which were piled up almost at the ceiling of his living room in his long-term rented apartment in Brooklyn. Had it not been for Max Perkins, uh, the brilliant editor at Scribner's, which had been his publisher, who ruthlessly and indefatigably edited this mountain of literary output, uh, Wolf's works would never have been published. When Wolf finally handed Perkins what he considered the finished copy of Look Home at Angel, uh, his manuscript was 1,100 pages, 350,000 words, twice the size of War and Peace. Uh, Perkins went to work with Wolf, finally cutting it down heroically to 544 pages, arguing every step of the way with this wild, untamed, inchoate, uh, raging, incredibly talented, but difficult writer. And in the end, uh, he produced a literary masterpiece that has been read by people all over the world. A few words about Max Perkins and Wolf. Max Perkins, as some of you may know, was probably the most widely known literary editor in American history. Um, <clears throat> he had a very strong relationship with Thomas Wolfe. Uh, it could be because Perkins had five daughters and saw Wolfe as a kind of surrogate son. I think Wolfe saw Max Perkins as the spiritual father that he had been seeking throughout his life. Um, <clears throat> Wolf broke off relations with Perkins in 1936, uh, not that long before he actually died. Uh, it was heartbreaking for Perkins. Uh, the reasons are a little vague, but it could have been because Wolf and his ego may have resented Perkins' ruthless editing of his work. Also, there were rumors spreading that Wolf's success was probably equally due to Max Perkins as it was due to the writer himself, who could have resented this. At any rate, in 1936, um, Edward Aswell from Harper's and Harper's uh, Publishing wooed Wolf away from Scribner's. Uh, Wolf died in 1938, and it was Edward Aswell who poured through the tons of material left behind and somehow fashioned out of that massive material, the web in the rock, and you can't go home again. Now, what's poignant and stirring is that on his deathbed, Thomas Wolfe, uh, shortly before he lapsed into his final coma, wrote a letter to Max Perkins. He acknowledged in that letter that Perkins had helped realize his work and had made his work possible. In closing, he wrote the following, I shall always think of you and feel about you the way it was that 4th of July day three years ago. When you met me at the boat, he was coming back from Europe, and we went to the cafe on the river and had a drink and later went on top of the tall building and all the strangeness and the glory and the power of life and of the city was below. I don't know why writers' reputations rise or fall, just as I don't know why a beloved restaurant simply goes out of favor with the public and closes. Uh, it could be that post-war, uh, World War II literary critics found it difficult to confront a massive sort of uh, wild talent um, like Thomas Wolfe, uh, and they appreciated more the discipline control of a writer like Ernest Hemingway or F. Scott Fitzgerald, or for that matter, Faulkner or Willie Cather, all of whom have rock solid reputations today. All I know is that I love Thomas Wolfe. I have read almost all his works. It's said that you have to read Thomas Wolfe when you're young, but I find myself now in my 80s uh, reading him all over again and feeling uh, just as enraptured with his writing as I was when I was in college. 
Thomas Wolfe, in my opinion, has written some of the most gorgeous poetic prose of the 20th century, <clears throat> a small portion of which I would like to share with you today, because only a direct exposure to his finest writing can reflect the true genius of Wolfe. A few facts about his life. He was born in 1900 in Asheville, North Carolina, a bustling town nestled at the foot of a mountain chain. Um, he was the youngest of eight children. His mother was Julia, his father was William, his father was a successful stone cutter and sold headstones for cemeteries. His mother ultimately opened a very successful boarding house. And interestingly, she took her youngest, Thomas, to live with her in the boarding house while the rest of the family continued to live in the traditional family home. He was privately educated, but at the age of 15, went to the University of North Carolina, uh, graduated when he was 19, went on to Harvard, got a master's degree uh, at George Pierce Baker's famous 47 playwriting workshop. Thomas Wolfe desperately wanted to be a playwright, but he ultimately realized that his talent lay in fiction and not in playwriting. He simply couldn't control the flow of language and material that, that came out of him. Um, uh, Wolf uh, went to Europe on a number of occasions uh, simply to get away from the stress and controversy that he was constantly causing. In 1925, on a boat back from England, he met Aline Bernstein, uh, a very successful theatrical set designer a woman 20 years his senior, already married with two children. They entered into a very intense, ultimately tumultuous love affair that lasted about seven years. She became his dear friend, his patron, his muse, his antagonist, his severest critic. She was Jewish. Uh, Wolf, like so many of the writers we've been discussing, shared anti-Semitic views of the 1920s and 30s. <clears throat> and often mocked her Jewishness, which you'll find embedded throughout the web in the rock, but he loved her. And as a matter of fact, uh, just before he died, uh, he sent her a message telling her so, even though they had been separated for a while. A wolf died on a trip to the great national parks of America. He visited 11 of them. He hadn't been to that part of America before. And his whole purpose was to uh, extrapolate the experience of traveling in the Northwest of America into his latest book. He contracted uh, pneumonia in Seattle. Uh, it wouldn't go away. It finally developed into a form of tuberculosis, which literally paralyzed his brain, fell into a coma and died two weeks later at the age of 37. Thomas Wolfe believed that any writer who's going to write anything of worth has to write autobiographically. There is no other way for a writer to attain a goal of qualitative literature. So Wolf wrote about his life, his hometown, his parents, his siblings, his fellow townspeople, his highly subjective response to the most seemingly mundane and trivial events of his life talked about his college years at North Carolina, his Harvard years, his trips abroad, his affair with Aline Bernstein, his years of living in Brooklyn at a shabby rented apartment where he did so much of his work. From 1924 to about 1931, sort of on and off, he taught English literature at the Washington Square campus of New York University, precisely where I got my PhD in literature a number of years later. Thomas Wolfe evidently wished to record everything that happened to him in his life. And this is what fascinates me. And it's what, it's what fascinates me about poets because poets are trying to do the same thing. Some of our greatest poems are about utterly trivial incidents that the poet miraculously captures and brings to vivid life. Uh, and this is why we love literature. This is why we love poetry because it enhances intensifies our appreciation of the dailiness of our human existence. 
but that urge to include everything is also part of his flaw as a writer, which he readily admitted in a wonderful book <clears throat> that I certainly uh, urge everybody to take a look at. It's the autobiography of an American novelist, um, which I hadn't read before until I prepared this lecture. Indispensable if you really like uh, Thomas Wolfe. I'll read some passages later. Uh, he, he was addicted to adjectives. Uh, he was addicted to massive chants that went on for pages, uh, rhythmic, but at times uh, sort of meaningless in terms of the organic connection to his larger work. Uh, his massive catalog of things, seeing the, the dimensions, the nuances, the hues, the details, the architectural details, the countryside. He just wanted to embrace, embrace the mag magnificence of experience, no matter how seemingly uh, mundane. Uh, listening to the milk being delivered in a small town, the clink of the cans as they land on your doorstep, a train uh, hooting its horn in the middle of the night as it passes through your town, uh, the sight of a hayfield, or the sight of a barn, or the sight of a bridge over a brook of bubbling water, or conversations between people, ordinary people, that he would capture with incredible fidelity. Um, he describes what it was like to write Look Homeward Angel. And you have to feel sorry because he was a writer who was literally tormented by his capacity to write. I'm reading his own words. Uh, writing Look Homeward Angel was more an act of possession than a conscious piece of writing. I really can't say the book was written. It was something that took hold of me and possessed me. And before I was done with it, it seemed to me that it had done for me. It was exactly as if this great black storm cloud I had spoken of had opened up and amid flashes of lightning was pouring from its depth a torrential and ungovernable flood. Wolf said, I don't know how I became a writer, but I think it was because of a certain force in me that had to write. And that finally, like some kind of energy or torrent or pent power burst through to form a channel. And what was it that compelled this giant of a man, compelled by this ferocious energy to capture every nuance of life in such beautiful prose? He obviously had a photographic memory. He obviously had a capacity for total recall. I don't know if you know anybody with this capacity. They're very rare. He could recapture details of places, people, and incidents, uh, even though they had occurred years and years ago. And again, James Joyce, uh, his mentor and literary idol, did the same in Ulysses. James Joyce could remember every street, every pub, every store, every building, every face of every person he ever knew in Dublin, even though he hadn't been back to Dublin in 30 or 40 years. Total recall. Wolf tried to explain this capacity in his own words. I have, for example, a very tenuous, a very literal, vivid, concrete memory. The quality of my memory is characterized by, I believe, in a more than ordinary degree, by the intensity of its sense impression its power to invoke and bring back the odors, sounds, colors, shape, and feel of things with concrete vividness. Uh, in the midst of writing Look Homeward Angel, he was living alone in a shabby rented apartment in Brooklyn, and he was literally tormented in his own words. 
Now my memory was at work night and day in a way that I could at first neither check nor control. And that swarmed unbidden at all hours and moments of the day and night in a stream of blazing pageantry across my mind with the million forms and substance of the life and air that I had left his hometown from which I had been derived, which was my own, America. Uh, he couldn't sleep. He would walk the streets all night long. He would talk to anybody that would cross his path. Uh, he was literally possessed. Uh, let me just read a portion, a small portion of a piece called America, which is found in a remarkable book called The Face of a Nation, official passages from the writings of Thomas Wolfe, published in 1939. I went on Amazon to just check on the book. I have an old copy. And their first offering on Amazon is a copy of this book for $785. Uh, so it's a somewhat rare book. But here is the opening passage called America. America has a thousand lights and weathers and we walk the streets. We walk the streets forever. We walk the streets of life alone. It is the place of the howling winds, the hurrying of the leaves in old October, the hard clean falling to the earth of acorns, the place of the storm tossed moaning of the wintry mountainside where the young men cry out in their throats and feel the savage vigor, the rustle, strong energies, the place also where the trains cross rivers. It is a fabulous country, the only fabulous country. It is the one place where miracles not only happen, but where they happen all the time. It is the place where great boats are baying at the harbor's mouth, where great ships are putting out to sea. It is the place where great boats are blowing in the Gulf of Night and where the river, the dark and secret river, full of strange time, is forever flowing by us to the sea. And he ends this passage with the following. It is the place of fast approach, the hot, blind, smoky passage, the tragic, lonely beauty of New England and the web of Boston, the place of the mighty station there and engines passive as great cats, the straight, dense plumes of engine smoke, the acrid and exciting smell of trains and stations and of the man swarm passing ever in its million footed weft, the smell of the sea and harbors and the thought of voyages and the place of the goat cry, the strong joy of our youth, the magic city, when we knew the most fortunate life on earth would certainly be ours, that we were 20 and would never die. And always America is the place of the deathless and enraptured moments. The eye that looked, the mouth that smiled and vanished, and the word, the stone, the leaf, the door we never found and never have forgotten. And these are the things that we remember of America. For we have known all her thousand lights and weathers, and we walk the streets, we walk the streets forever. We walk the streets of life alone. When Le Comrade Angel was finally published in 1929, uh, it contained 200 thinly disguised portraits of local characters in the novel. And much to perhaps uh, Thomas Wolfe's naive surprise, people were very upset. Nobody likes to see themselves depicted essentially in an objective way in a novel. 
And the outcry in Asheville, North Carolina was so intense that there were literally threats against his life. He was told not to come back into town. Um, and that lesson, he said, uh, brought some very powerful truths to his consciousness. One is the incredible power of the printed word. Something in print could be explosive. And a writer you should be aware of that, but sometimes they're not. Uh, so what is a writer's obligation? If, as Thomas Wolfe absolutely believed, a writer has to use the very materials of his or her life, then the people that you know, your family, your siblings, your friends, your acquaintances, your social contacts, your co-workers are all subject to your objective description of them. Uh, because it's very hard to hide those descriptions. Anyway, the outcry was so furious uh, that uh, Thomas Wolfe did not go back to Asheville for at least eight years. I find one of the most incredible passages um, the following, because I think it relates to all of us. And I think this is what makes us, or me in particular, so responsive to Thomas Wolfe. Listen to this. What fascinates him, you see, is under such heading as this, they would be brief and flash-like notations of those hundreds and thousands of things which all of us have seen for just a flash, a moment in our lives which are lost, gone, vanished, to never be recaptured, even at the moment that we see them, which seem to be trivial, fleeting, of no consequence whatever at the moment that we see them, and which are in our minds and hearts forever, which we can never forget, whose importance and significance we cannot attempt to estimate, since practically they seem to have no importance and significance at all but which are somehow pregnant with all the joy and sorrow of the human destiny, the tragic briefness of men's days and which we know somehow are therefore more important than many things of more apparent consequence. I don't know if this makes sense to you. Um, let me just relate an own, my own personal experience that haunts me to this day. I must have been 11 years old. My family, my two sisters and I were sitting in the back seat of our family car. My mother and father were in the front. We, the garage door opens, the car backed out. I was sort of huddled because it was cold. And I looked out the car window and I saw the light in my bedroom that was still on. And for some odd reason, I said to myself, I'm going to remember this moment for the rest of my life. Now that was more than 70 years ago. It's still as vivid to me now as it was when it actually happened. What Thomas Wolfe is saying is that <clears throat> try to put language to that momentary experience, which has stayed in your mind throughout most of your life. What did that mean to me? Did it have something to do with family solidarity that was later demolished? Did it have something to do with the closeness I felt to my older sister, which became later strained? Uh, was it that feeling of childlike innocence that one ultimately loses? For whatever reason, I chose that utterly trivial moment to remember forever. And this is what Thomas Wolfe did on a huge, massive scale. You see, <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna run out of time. So uh, let me, I wanna conclude by remarks about his life uh, <clears throat> and then read some passages to finalize my grappling with this great writer. 
Uh, Wolf, as I said, died tragically young. Uh, I think his career was still ahead of him. Uh, he was young, he was full of ferocious energy. He had brilliant insights, he had creativity, and still had to be expended. We don't know what the rest of his life would have been like, but the New York Times had an interesting obituary. Printed in 1938. He bestrode American literature like a colossus. A sort of splendid eloquence came from him, an absolute faith in the power of words to recreate reality, a determination and an assured promise that he would encompass the whole romantic, impressionistic, plastic language of America. A million emotive words had streamed from his pencil. In all of them, there were life and poetry and a great generosity of feeling. Let me conclude with just some set pieces that I find moving. I go back to them again and again. Um, this is poetic prose. This is prose that could easily be transfigured into poetry. A stone, a leaf, a door. A stone, a leaf, an unfound door of a stone, a leaf, a door, and of all the forgotten faces. Naked and alone, we came into exile. In her Doric womb, we did not know our mother's face. From the prison of her flesh have we come into the unspeakable and incommunicable prison of this earth. Which of us has known his brother? Which of us has looked into his father's heart? Which of us has not remained forever prison pent? Which of us is not forever a stranger and alone? Oh, waste of loss in the hot mazes, lost among bright stars. On this most weary, unbright cinder, lost. Remembering speechlessly, we seek the great forgotten language. The lost lane end into heaven, a stone, a leaf, an unfound door. In the interest of time, let me just share with you an extraordinary passage, like nothing I'd ever read before. Uh, Thomas Wolfe takes the most inescapable and universal of all human experiences, the death of a parent, and he elevates it into something almost epic and grand. Uh, Wolf's father died when he was 22, uh, just graduating from Harvard with his MA. And he came back home for the funeral in October, which is a highly symbolic month for Thomas Wolfe. And let me share with you this incredible passage from No Door, which is part of a wonderful collection called The Complete Short Stories of Thomas Wolfe. My father was dead and now it seemed to me that I had never found him. He was dead, and yet I sought him everywhere and could not believe that he was dead and was sure that I would find him. It was October, and that year after years of absence and of wandering, I had come home again. I could not think that he had died, but that I had come home in October, and all the life that I had known there was strange and sorrowful as dreams. And yet I saw it all in shapes of deathless brightness, the town, the streets, the magic hills, and the plain faces of the people I had known as if I had revisited the shores of this great earth with a heart of fire, a cry of pain and ecstasy, a memory of intolerable longing and regret for all that glorious and exultant life which I must visit now forever as a fleshless ghost, never to touch, to hold, 
to have its palpable warmth and substance my own again. I had come home again, and yet I could not believe that he was dead, and I thought I heard his great voice ringing in the street again, and that I would see him striding toward me across the square with his gaunt, earth-devouring stride, or find him waiting every time I turned the corner, or lunging toward the house, bearing the tremendous provender of his food and meat, bringing to us all the deathless security of his strength and power and passion, bringing to us all again the roaring message of his fires that shook the fireful chimney throat with their terrific blast, giving to us all again the exultant knowledge that the good days, the magic days, the golden weather of our lives would come again, and that this dream-like and phantasmal world in which I found myself would waken instantly as it had once, to all the palpable warmth and glory of the earth, if only my father would come back to make it live, to give us life again. Therefore, I could not think that he was dead. And at night in my mother's house, I would lie on my bed in the dark, hearing the wind that rattled dry leaves along the empty pavement, hearing far off across the wind the barking of a dog, feeling dark time strange time, dark secret time as it flowed on around me, remembering my life, the house, and all the million strange and secret visages of time, thinking, feeling, thinking. October has come again, has come again. I have come home again and found my father dead. And this was time. Time, time, where shall I go now? What shall I do? October has come again, but there has gone some richness from the life we knew, and we are lost. But he ends this passage with an extraordinary finale that I must have thrilled a lot of young people with hope. Suddenly I knew that every man who ever lived has looked, is looking for his father. And that even when his father dies, his son will search furiously the streets of life to find him. And that he never loses hope but always feels that someday he will see his father's face again. I had come home again in October and there were no doors. There were no doors for me to enter. And I knew now that I could never make this life my own again. Yet in all this huge unrest that was goading me to flight, I had no place or door or dwelling place on earth to go. And yet must make for myself a life different from the one my father made for me or die myself. Storms shook the house at night and there was something calling in the wind. It spoke to me and filled my heart with the exultant prophecies of flight, darkness, and discovery, saying with a demon's whisper of unbodied joy, away, away, away. There are new lands, morning, and a shining city. Child, child, go find the earth again. Let me conclude with the last thing that Thomas Wolfe wrote literally before he slipped into his final coma. It's called Toward Which. Something has spoken to me in the night, burning the tapers of the waning year. Something has spoken in the night and told me I shall die, I know not where, saying, to lose the earth you know for greater knowing, to lose the life you have for greater life, to leave the friends you loved for greater loving, to find a land more kind than home, more large than earth, whereon the pillars of this earth are founded toward which 
the conscience of the world is tending. A wind is rising and the rivers flow. Thank you. First, we have a few minutes for <laughs> thoughts, comments, experiences, reading experiences of Thomas Pope. If anyone has anything they'd like to say, just unmute yourself, please. I just want to say that I appreciate uh, the opportunity to discuss uh, one of my favorite writers. I appreciate your attention. I look forward to the rest of the series. And uh, Chris, thank you so much for arranging this. Uh, much appreciated. I'll see you soon. Yes, Lucy. Me? I just wanted to say I, I was so impressed. I, I have a good friend who's a fan of Thomas Wolfe. I'm sure I read him younger, but I, while we're while I'm listening, I downloaded Look Homeward Angel onto my phone. So I'll be listening to it in the car and when I walk. And uh, the idea of the film about him is, is very interesting to me too. So thank you for that. Yeah, Jude Law. <laughs> One of my favorites, Colin Firth. Uh, Jude Law did not give the physical impression of Thomas Wolfe, um, but the film clearly portrays him as a very difficult man. Uh, he never married because there was no there was no woman that it, that could ever possibly live with him, as you as you can see even from his description of the tumult and torment he felt while writing *Look Home with Angel*. A writer is a difficult person almost by definition. And in Thomas Wolfe's case, uh, the definition is greatly expanded. But yeah, take a look at the film. Uh, you can get it, uh, you know, from... Netflix. I saw the film. I got it on Netflix. It was really good. Yeah. It wasn't, wasn't boring at all. Very um, enlightening. Yeah. Um, what I learned is that he was a very good psychologist. Uh, yes. I'm a social psychologist, and I have not written a memoir, even though people have told me I should because I've had an interesting life, for just the reasons that he faced when he wrote about people. I would have to out people, and <laughs> it could be very troublesome. Yes. I'm uh, happy to hear that part. That was very informative. No, thank you. Uh, that's. It, I didn't really dwell on his... A brilliant capacity for characterization, which of course, as you well know, uh, takes psychological acuity and insight, and he had it. Uh, sometimes his, character, his characterizations were crude. He indulged in caricature. Uh, he mimicked Brooklyn accents, which were, are embarrassing to read today. Um, and he, look, he shared the prejudices of his time, but Here's an important point. When he went to Europe, he went to Europe essentially to escape the controversies and tensions at home, but also he ultimately realized that the best way to understand America is to leave America. Uh, he goes to Italy, he goes to Switzerland, he goes to England. He loved Germany. He felt a tremendous rapport with Germany and German people. He had many friends in Germany. Now he indulged in the anti-Semitism that was part and parcel of the culture of the 1920s and the 1930s in America. We see it in Hemingway, we see it in Fitzgerald, uh, we see it in E.E. E. Cummings, we see it uh, throughout the American culture. But by 1936, Wolf was horrified to see how the Jews were being treated in Germany. <coughs> and he came home and wrote a story called, I Have Something to Tell You, 
which was published in the New Republic in 1936. And the German Nazi government banned his entree into the country uh, for the rest of uh, his life. So what I'm trying to say is that on one level, Thomas Wolfe can be uh, scoffed at for indulging in cultural prejudices, but on his individual uh, conscience level, he transcended prejudice. Uh, he was horrified by Southern violence against uh, black people, horrified, and condemned it in some of his most powerful stories. Sort of like Faulkner, you know? So thank you for bringing this up. It's an important point. Mm. Mm. So uh, Chris, if you could arrange the showing of the film, <laughs> maybe or uh, making sure that everybody has access to some of these works. Uh, you know, could I sit down now and read a 900 page novel, you know, like uh, of time in the river? I don't know. Uh, all I know is that what I have been reading lately of Wolf uh, still enraptures me as vividly as it did when I was uh, 60 years younger. Uh, any other points or comments? I, <clears throat> Again, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to spend time with you and I look forward to seeing you soon for the next writer. <laughs>